Okay, people are starting to come in. So we're just gonna wait for a couple minutes for everybody to, um, to start coming into the room. So happy to have everyone here today, especially after last night. <laughs> that was quite a show. I'm really glad we got a good turnout for today. So it's really exciting. Let's see. Yeah, we have a lot of, of folks rolling on in. Um, what we're gonna do is just, we'll wait a couple more minutes as I see it's still climbing. So, so let's give it a few more minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I think we can probably, let me just take care of some business type stuff. Um, my, okay, so I guess, I guess we'll just, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Susan Phillips and I'm the interim director of the Robert Redford Conservancy for Southern California Sustainability. And I wanted to welcome you all today first by acknowledging our presence on traditional ancestral lands of the Gabrielino Tongva people. And we're lucky enough to be able to work in partnership with them here at Pitzer College and with the Redford Conservancy in particular. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple things about the Conservancy. So our mission is to engage people in communities in work for socio-ecological justice and sustainability in our region and beyond. And each fall and spring, we bring distinguished speakers to our campus, or in this case, to um, our virtual space, our virtual campus. And, and the point of these is to engage in discussion and conversation, to have symposia or panels. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that this will be recorded. I'm gonna actually cut and paste in case you have classes or other folks that you think would like to access this after the fact. This is the website where um, it will be recorded. I just put it into the chat. Um, um, and the, actually there's a bunch of other wonderful events and wonderful talks on there that, that, um, that have been done in the past. And, and that brings me to the other thing I wanted to say, which you know, before we do this today, I wanted to acknowledge Bryn, uh, Brenda Sarathy, who is the director of the Robert Redford Conservancy and this talk with um, Julie Z and Mike Mendez was totally her conception. So I just wanted to thank her for that and also for trusting me with the reins of the program temporarily while she's on leave. So thank you, Brenda. Um, I wanted to say in terms of like housekeeping type stuff, we are gonna have questions. Um, you can, the chat is open, you can feel free to chat. But if you do have questions that you would like to be addressed, um, oh, the chat is disabled in Zoom. Okay, the chat has been disabled. So <clears throat> I will, uh, John, I think will be able to- if you, uh, if you change the message from to all panelists, to all, all panelists and attendees, attendees will be able to see it. So you can just repaste the link. Oh, nice, got it, thank you. Okay, I just repasted the link. Um, and that link is where the, uh, this event will be recorded and where you also can find previous events. So um, what I was gonna say about the chat and how to thank you, Selec, how to um, ask questions during this event, we're gonna have a QA and a period. Um, it will, feel free to chat up the storm if you want to during the conversation. People love to do that. And it's one of the really fun ways of building community during things like this. Um, but in terms of if you want to uh, have a question answered, it'll be a little bit harder for me to follow those through the thread of the chat. So if you could put your formal questions in the Q&A, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, okay, so without further ado, I want to introduce our speakers. Um, oh, and at, basically, Mike, Michael Mendez and Julie C, they're both here to discuss their new books about climate change and environmental justice. And I'm gonna take a minute to introduce them. Um, then I will ask them a question that it kind of allows them to talk about their book. So each of them is gonna be doing a, a mini kind of presentation 
of their book and their work and themselves. Um, and then I will ask them more questions, we'll kind of have a conversation. And at about 5.45 or 5.50, we're gonna open it up to the audience for question and answer. And again, I'll be monitoring the chat as much as I can, but try to focus on the Q&A. Okay, so Michael Mendez is an assistant professor of environmental planning and policy at the University of California, Irvine. He previously served in California as a senior consultant, lobbyist and gubernatorial appointee during the passage of the state's internationally acclaimed climate change legislation. His new book is Climate Change from the Streets, How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthen the Environmental Justice Movement, published with Yale in 2020. And it's about the contentious politics of incorporating environmental justice into global climate change policy. So he argues that we have to incorporate local knowledge, culture, and history into policymaking in order to fully address the global complexities of climate change and the real threats facing our local communities. Julie Z is a professor of American Studies at UC Davis. She's also the founding director of the Environmental Justice Project for UC Davis's John Muir Institute for the Environment. And in that capacity is the faculty advisor for 25 Stories from the Central Valley. Her new book is Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, published with UC Press in 2020. And it examines mobilizations and movements from protests at Standing Rock to activism in Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. And her book is, has been called an essential primer on environmental justice and is packed with cautiously hopeful stories for the future. Um, all the proceeds from this book are split between the Community Water Center and UPROS, which are two environmental justice organizations. In other words, buy the book, buy both books, you'll be doing a lot of folks a lot of good. Um, I want to thank you both so much for being here. And this is where the crowd normally would really start to applaud. Um, but I'm going to move right into the first question. Um, the I wanted to start today with the title of Julie's book. Um, environmental justice in a moment of danger. And this is the question where I'm kind of asking you to talk about yourselves and your book, but linking it to this contemporary moment in terms of politics and climate emergency. In other words, how do you both in your work separately um, define this moment of danger? Um, how do you work within that moment? And, and also, how did you come to the work? You know, what about, what is it about you, your positionality, your history that led you to these topics? And how has that moment of danger sort of shifted and changed through time? And what uh, shape does it take in your work? So this is an invitation for Mike. Go ahead if you'd like to um, share your screen and, and we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say, followed by, by Julie. Uh, thank you, Susan. It's such a pleasure to be here. I thank you for the invitation. I'd like to thank the director of the Robert Redford uh, Conservancy uh, for extending the invitation to both uh, myself and Julie. And it's quite an honor to be on this esteemed panel with uh, Julie Sees. I remember reading her very first book and now I'm on a panel with her on, on her third book. So um, thank you for this opportunity. So to answer that question, I'm going to start with um, talking about a broad overview about my book. Let me share my screen and make sure it looks great okay there goes full screen perfect in california we're experiencing a major climate change crisis in the last two months millions of people have been impacted by the fires blackouts heat waves hazardous air quality and the ever-present covid 19 pandemic these are all major life events and very uh, representative of this historic moment for social justice uh, more, most importantly, currently three of the 10 largest wildfires by acreage in California's history are currently burning. These compounding of disasters uh, have cascading health, social, economic um, uh, impacts. Due to existing structural inequality, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. To address the climate emergency, activists and policymakers have proposed the Green New Deal at the federal level. As many of you know, the Green New Deal is a radical uh, proposal to, to decarbonize our economy and address poverty and inequality. Uh, for the last two decades, low-income communities of color have also pushed state and local governments to exper experiment with reducing greenhouse gas emissions and approaches that also address inequality and public health. 
These efforts um, and climate experimentation, however, have been contentious and are often met with significant resistance. However, I'm also here to tell you that there's nothing new about the Green New Deal. As I mentioned before, uh, climate activists, environmental justice activists have been doing this for nearly 20 years. Uh, climate change experiments in places like California, which is the basis of my research, have been all out street fights. Environmental justice activists have, are often pitted against traditional environmentalists who favor the, the least costly mitigation solu solutions which do not necessarily maximize equity and public health outcomes in low-income communities of color. These conflicts uh, uh, over climate change are cultural at their core. They illustrate that although the science of climate change is clear, policy decisions about how to respond to its effects remain contentious. Even when such decisions are claimed to be uh, guided by objective knowledge, they are made and implemented through political institutions and, and, and relationships and all the competing power struggles and interests that this implies. If we look towards the example of California, it reveals the contingent nature of climate policy, the assumptions and social, political, and cultural attitudes that often create conflict between community understandings of local environmental conditions and the prevailing global top-down conceptualization of uh, climate change. In California, tensions between different approaches to addressing climate change are often centered on the politics of scale, economics, and race. These differences in worldviews, if unacknowledged, can lead to the breakdown of trust, even among groups that are nominally working towards the same goal, reducing the harm climate change would do to human uh, societies and our planet. For insight into national level climate uh, conflicts around climate change, um, about working towards climate change and justice, one should look towards a nearly two decade uh, experiment of incorporating environmental justice and health equity principles into climate change policy. For environmental justice activists in California, the main threat from climate change is a disproportionate harm it causes to their bodies and the health of their communities. For them, climate change is not just about greenhouse gas models, Rather, it's also about opposing worldviews through which policy and science is seen. Yet, California is still often seen as a homogenous entity that uniformly values environmentalism and climate action. This image universalizes the idea of climate change and detaches it from its cultural settings. It also obscures how the localization of environmental policy and science within the state involves processes of public consultation and legitimacy. For example, in this 2018 book that was published by a major uh, academic university press, it takes a, a very traditional environmental uh, narrative of California's environmental history, which includes an erasure of people of color and their influence in comprehensive environmental policy. I blocked out the name of the book and the author because I don't want to target them here, but in this nearly 300 page uh, book that, def uh, that uh, markets itself as a definitive environmental history of California, people of color are only represented reference three times throughout the whole book. So there's this continual erasure, erasure of people of color. And therefore my book, Climate Change from the Streets, had an explicit focus on people of color. And this book uh, foregrounds people, place and power in the context of climate change and inequality and trying to write in people of color in California's environmental history. This research originated in my public policy work for the California State Legislature during a 15 year period. This provided me valuable insight into how the interactions of governments, activists, businesses, and NGOs shape climate change policy. My research is further influenced by my experience growing up in Latino immigrant communities of Los Angeles that face multiple environmental threats. As a youth in Pocoima, I was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism. Whether protests in the siting of landfills or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic sites, um, they sought to understand how these situations originated, to develop alternatives, and to imagine new environmental futures. This has focused my work on what the conceptualization of environmental justice and climate change has meant to activists, policymakers, and scholars. The case of California is particularly productive as a climate experiment as the world's fifth largest economy and the only U.S. state to implement a comprehensive program of regulatory and market-based mechanisms to reduce greenhouse gas emission emissions. California had consistently been at the forefront of broader national and global environmental experimentation. The state's cap and trade program, a central market-based mechanism for ensuring, ensuring carbon emissions reductions, is the third largest in the world after the European Union and China. 
The program has been especially contentious in debates within California. Supporters emphasize its global reach and cost effectiveness, and detractors criticize its inequitable effects on specific local communities and demographic groups. California's prominence in climate policy makes it an ideal place to investigate the dynamics of such disputes and their roots in differing climate change worldviews. My multi-scale ethnographic policy approach weaves together an analysis of three interconnected case studies. The first two look at climate and public health activism in two heavily impacted uh, communities of color, Richmond and Oakland, California. The second looks at conflict over state level carbon trading and use of its revenue for investment in low income communities of color, most harmed by air pollution. And then finally, it looks at international and local uh, implications of, of forest conservation projects in the global south and Mexico and Brazil, allowed under California's market based climate change laws. These cases combine to re reveal the contested politics of local, state, and transnational levels on which California makes climate change policy and takes action. There to, uh, therefore, to summarize, my three aims of my multi-scalar research is to demonstrate that public health and environmental justice perspectives can be central to successful climate change policy development and implementation, offer an interdisciplinary framework for theorizing the kinds of negotiations between scales and worldviews that are involved in the development of equitable climate change policy, and finally, provide a set of findings that activists can use to negotiate with governments that legitimizes their perspectives about the differential impact of climate change on disadvantaged communities of color. So in closing, uh, my embodied research represents new models of engagement with climate change that make space for alternative paradigms of environmental protection. My engagement with uh, key stakeholders since 2006 has allowed me to critically analyze how the success of climate policy in California now depends on incorporating marginalized voices and embodied perspectives from the local and global scales. Thank you for this opportunity and I'll hand it off to Julie. Thank you, uh, Mike and Susan. Um, it's really great to have a chance to chat with you and I was really excited to um, be on a panel with Mike who I've known for a few years. Um, in terms of how I got here and what this book is about and sort of how it's all threaded together, um, I come from a working class immigrant community in New York City. Uh, I had no prior experience with any conception of nature or the environment or environmental justice. Um, for me, I came to this material um, much later in life. Um, I was a college student at UC Berkeley. Um, I took Carl Anthony's Race, Poverty, and the Environment class in the early 90s. And what I didn't know at the time was that um, who Carl Anthony was and how important he was. Um, and I just was sort of lucky enough to be in uh, at Berkeley when there was this coalescing of social movements um, around racial justice and this burgeoning awareness by activists at the student scale, both undergraduate and graduate students, and also at the community level in the Bay Area around environmental justice issues. So, you know, I kind of, I cut my tooth as a, my teeth as like a student organizer that got really deep into environmental justice while there was all this organizing against Prop 187, against the anti-affirmative action, you know, the anti-immigrant uh, referendum, the anti uh, three strikes you're out. Um, and so, you know, it was sort of like, you know, I was just lucky um, to be taking classes with Ron Takaki and Carl Anthony. Um, and I didn't really even understand, you know, how I was, um, it was a, a function of kind of time and place. Um, but there's nothing really about my background that would, you know, say that I have to, that would explain why I have spent 27 years working on environmental justice um, movements, except in so far as that the ethnic studies worldview um, and my own lack of um, understanding of, of the history of the U.S., especially race and racism um, and around settler colonialism. You know, I, I retain that kind of outrage that I had when I was 18, when I learned about all these things that I had never learned about before. You know, I had, uh, I knew about anti-Asian racism in a sort of generic sense because we lived it, you know, growing up in Chinatown. But I did not know the full history um, within the U.S. of how much it is built on um, anti-Blackness and settler colonialism. And so I think why that story matters is that I, I like to actually retain my, my anger, you know, A, and not knowing, and 
be not accepting these as, as like just the way it is. So that kind of shapes my sensibility. Um, I took this work, um, I, was, I did student organizing again um, it, with environmental justice um, organizations, and then I worked um, at, uh, in New York with an environmental justice group. And I, I went back to grad school because organizing work and academic work, there is some overlap, but sometimes there isn't really a space to ask certain kinds of questions because of the kind of urgency. Um, but even as a grad student doing the research for my book, I was always, I've always been um, connected with um, environmental justice movements. There's no separation for me between my research and the movements that I, I work with and an alliance um, with. So engaged scholarship and um, community struggles are really central um, to what I do and why I do it. Um, so that's a big preface to, I just wanna briefly go in um, to this. Um, can you see my screen right now? Okay, is the visual cut off right there or can you see it? No, it's perfect. Okay, um, so yesterday was the debate um, and I, I really liked um, this Jake Tapper quote afterwards, which you know you could read it yourself. And I posted this on Facebook and then my friend said, yeah, and also a wildfire and also a pandemic, you know? And so I think, you know, in this question of like, why or why, what is this moment of danger right now we're in? Um, I wrote this book before, you know, the pandemic exploded, uh, before this like explosion of wildfires, um, before this precipice of this political crisis that we are, um, we are on an edge of a political crisis that has not been seen in, a, in, in the US for, for, for a very long time. And it's very scary and it's frightening. So I think the, the question of crises and what is the danger right now um, is only heightened by what I talk about in the book. I was also thinking about this idea of syndemic, um, which in a disease context is talking about how there are interlocking, how things can make each other worse. So coming from a disease standpoint, uh, the, the medical anthropologist who coined this was talking about tuberculosis and AIDS in African-American communities. Like that there are these things that, that pile on and make things worse. And in a lot of ways, I was thinking about this because I remember the moment, I remember the moment when environmental racism was um, made clear to me and which like took my breath away. Um, because, you know, for me, and I'm, I'm old enough that there wasn't GIS, there wasn't this kind of cool visualizations that happened. It was still the old school transparencies. And so I remember this transparency of race and lead poisoning and asthma. And uh, I think, I don't remember school absences, whatever it was, stuff that now I think we understand as, you know, we, we understand um, that it exists. But in the early nineties, it was much more like you had to empirically prove it was true, you know? But I remember that moment going, oh my God, you know, this is horrendous, you know, and, and me, and I've always wanted to understand why. And I think that idea of the syndemic or the, the interlocking um, conditions is the basic framework, as Michael indicated, of what environmental justice offers. Environmental justice movement always said there was no separation between racism and environmental inequality. There was no separation between these different problems. And I think this moment now really makes that so clear to, to anybody who didn't know um, or anybody who, who cares. Um, and so, you know, you could see this in the wildfire and the climate crisis. Uh, and Michael's done some important work on this um, about how, you know, the conditions of wildfire hit the people who are already burdened um, the most, like farm workers, for example. Oh, uh, so, you know, I like to the, uh, put these up now too, because um, this is like a new slide for me. Um, some of this I just learned, like the first one, that the U.S. is the single greatest contributor to cum cumulative carbon emissions since 1750. So 25% of global emissions comes from the U.S. Um, I'm a professor of American studies. So, you know, thinking about what that means from a U.S. context and what is the weight of our responsibility um, being in an institution um, that's based in the U.S., um, it, you know, before, uh, until 1882 is the, the U.K. because of colonialism. Um, many of you know this already, but it's worth making very clear. 100 companies are responsible for 71% of emissions. And further, if you want to drill down, 20 firms are responsible for a third of global emissions. So that question of disproportionality, that question of power um, is very much um, a core 
um, analytic for the environmental justice movement. Less than 5% of the world's population is in the US, but um, a vastly disproportionate number of the world's incarcerated people are here. Incredible racial disparities for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. Um, highest rates of police killings, um, four times higher than the next highest, which is Canada. Um, America, uh, the US owns, um, people in the US own 45% uh, of the world's privately held firearms. And now the US has 25% of the world's COVID deaths, incredibly uh, racially disproportionate deaths, uh, rates and deaths for black and Latino populations. I think that number is now down to 20%. But my point is about the question of disproportionality, both within um, the US context, but also further in without, within the US, there's racial disproportionalities. So I like to put this together because I think this at least gets to your question of like, what's at stake? What are the dangers we face right now? So this book, um, Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger, um, comes from the American Studies Now series, which are these short, teachable books. Um, and I think I wrote this book um, mostly as a way to synthesize a lot of the different movements that people know about. So as opposed to in the early 90s, where there was this like step of empirical documentation, now because of social media, many more people you know, will say, oh, I know Standing Rock, or they've heard of what happened in Flint, um, or so on. Uh, but at the same time, there's so much information that it can get, it can be hard to kind of go through or, you know, understand exactly what happened and when. So I wrote this as a short kind of primer for people um, around these issues of environmental justice. And, and you mentioned already the royalties for uh, go to two organizations um, that I work uh, with. Uprose is my um, collaborator in New York that I've worked with for 27 years. So the, the book asks a simple question, what crossroads and moment are we in? And what might we learn from environmental justice in our moment of danger? And I, I'll actually get to the second question, I think in the Q&A. Um, but just to be clear, the, um, for me, the moment of danger is many things that are interwoven, that cannot be separated, they're threaded together. That's anti-immigrationism, anti-refugee politics, there's a nationalist political authoritarianism. There's militarized security discourse, um, racist public policies, regressive gender policies, and climate change denial and hostility. And this is not unique to the US. This is true in the US, but it's also true in the Philippines, in India, Brazil, Poland, and Hungary. So I wanted to um, both talk about the particular US dangers um, because of the weight of you know, the US US-based multinationals, but also understand what's happening in the US within this broader global context. Um, and so the book is structured, it's very small, a short book, um, as a, a combination of keywords and, and uh, case studies. So the first chapter looks at Standing Rock and anti-pipeline protests um, through the framework, through keywords like settler colonialism, extraction, gender violence, and each um, chapter also has an envir uh, environmental justice group or um, to anchor, um, because a lot of the book is also about in the weight of all this danger, there is still always resistance. And that's the most important um, lesson to take away. That's the non-naive radical hope to leave with. Um, the second chapter looks at water racism and justice and injustice, looking at Flint and the Central Valley uh, region of California. Uh, and to look at those two case studies together uh, through understanding the politics of privatization and neoliberalism. And the organization there is the Community Water Center. The last chapter looks at disasters, these kind of very excessive disasters like Hurricane Katrina and Maria, um, climate justice activism in Kivalina in Alaska. Uh, Kivalina is one of 400 um, Arctic native villages that are currently um, facing sea level rise and have to be relocated. Um, Kivalina is not exceptional, um, it, but it is important because they sued, uh, the, uh, they sued 25 oil and gas companies for the damage from their, um, from uh, climate emissions. Um, the lawsuit got thrown out because uh, it was seen as um, not a legal issue, but a political one. So again, I think, you know, what, what Mike was pointing to, environmental justice doesn't accept those separations. It accepts that these things are deeply interconnected. Whereas the traditional framework might say, oh, well, that's legal, that's uh, political, that's public health, that's housing. Environmental justice and justice movements do not accept those boundaries. Um, the chapter also focus on, focuses on radical hope and disasters through thinking about restorative environmental justice and the um, anchor organization in that chapter is Uprose in New York. 
um, and their, their leadership in um, something called the Climate Justice Alliance and the idea of just transition, um, which is connected to what Mike was talking about uh, as well. Um, the argument of the book is that environmental justice are freedom struggles. And by freedom struggles, I mean um, connected to the um, struggles of uh, black, the black radical tradition, um, freedom struggles um, in terms of decolonizing movements. Um, they're particularly significant now because the threats that they have been fighting are even more intense. So I guess in some ways you could say all of us now are feeling like communities that have been victims to environmental racism. You know, like we have all, we're, we're getting the, all the shit that we never used to have to, if you didn't grow up in one of these communities, like didn't have to think about, you know, and maybe that's shocking to some people. Maybe it's normal to others. But I think as more of us feel the burden of all of this, like, you know, the wildfire smoke and the heat wave and the pandemic, you know, uh, we, it's, it's, uh, it behooves us to look at the lessons of organizers who have been fighting on those multiple fronts for a very long time. Environmental justice as a framework and as a movement is intersectional. Um, and I, I really appreciate Mike's attention to the body and thinking about uh, multi-scalar approaches. And environmental justice movements cross time and space. Though, so the um, analytic that people are talking about sometimes, you know, like in Kivalina, they talk about the doctrine of discovery, you know, and the, pro and the time scale being from, you know, colonialism and contact. So anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Um, and then uh, we'll move it over to questions. Great, thank you so much uh, for those wonderful um, kind of summaries and you know, just encapsulating all, all of those things. One of the things that, that came up in a, in a previous talk that we had um, a couple of weeks ago as part of our racial justice initiative as is something that I always have in, in my mind as well, which, which you've kind of touched on here, which is that if you, if you protect the mo and if you work to include and protect the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable places, then, then you really will have protected everyone. And, um, you know, if you think about the, the idea of, of, of breath, I've been thinking a lot about just the idea of breathing right now and, and all the things that you both are bringing up about, um, you know, that kind of cross-sectional resonance, you know, the idea of I can't breathe, starting with the idea of police violence, and then of course, um, asthma rates um, due to diesel particulate matter, you know, the idea of people across the country due to COVID, you know, in ventilators, um, you know, that this attacks the lungs um, and, and then, of course, in California, in particular in the West, the idea of, of rampant wildfires. And so I've been thinking about a lot about like the right to breathe as a kind of foundational concept. And then, of course, I know a lot of people who are really interested in mindfulness and they're like, you just have to come back to your breath. And, and it's like that foundation is somehow really compromised. Um, and I think that you both do a wonderful job of, of really talking about that intersectionality. And one of the questions I guess I have for you is, you know, you're two scholars and you work in a sense on different, on the same issues in a way, but just have really, really different approaches. And so I wanted to hear you both, and you started to touch on this a little bit, Julie, in terms of talking about Mike's work and the embodiment, but to talk about how do you understand that difference in each other's work and how do you value the work that the other ones do? You know, if you have any key questions for the, for the other person, like what would they be in terms of, you know, why they approach things? Who are they talking to? Who's the audience? What are the conceptualizations that really formulate, you know, what it is that, you know, makes a scholar an, a, a public scholar, you know, in that sense, which you both, I think, are activist scholars, engaged scholars, and public scholars in different ways. So just wanted to throw that out there um, for either of you to address. Maybe Mike, because Julie's just been talking, you can, you can start, not to put you... Sure, no, um, thank you for that question. And I, I think what I gain most from Julie's work and other colleagues uh, like David Pello, is this understanding of how do, how do you move the environmental justice um, theories, ideas, and frameworks to the next level. 
and they're part, they're part of a, a new generation, second generation of environmental justice um, scholars that are looking at what's uh, called critical environmental justice studies. And what Julie and uh, Susan, what you talked about is looking at multiple scales and understanding moving on a very bounded build site. Traditional environmental justice has been focused on hazardous waste done, so the very localized uh, type of uh, in, in justice or environmental racism, if you will. And, but understanding more of the structural of political, social, and economic structures that create that injustice in that part in Pocoyama or in, in Bronx, New York. Um, it's, it's part of it. Um, to, to solve a, a local problem, you often have to jump to different policy scales to resolve it and move constantly between those areas. And that's what I do in my book and what I've learned from people like Julie and David Pello about that um, is really understanding that multi multiple scales and how these environmental justice groups are not bounded either by space or time and that they're moving simultaneously, uh, but from the local scale to the regional, statewide, um, to the national, and then even to the United Nations and other countries. And a second aspect that I really appreciate um, uh, this, uh, this critical environmental justice scholars uh, focus again is on intersectionality and looking at the ways in which gender, um, race, income, immigration status, um, uh, sexuality intersect to create uh, disparate and new forms of impacts um, and, and these uh, in terms of environmental impacts, climate change impacts, or disaster impacts. And that's where my research is now is going into that more intersectional approach um, and Julie mentioned a new research project I have on looking at undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants in California and their impact with wildfires. And I, I just uh, did a, uh, a publishing article in one of the leading uh, geography journals, GeoForum, with um, community organizers. So this is a top uh, tier uh, journal in geography and I co-wrote it with them. They provided um, great field uh, influence and it gave them an opportunity for them to speak uh, um, for themselves as experts in their own right, both to in academic uh, terms, to the media, and now in, in sort of these policy briefings. We're doing policy briefings um, up and down the state now, the governor's office, local government and county offices, and we're going to even do a joint webinar uh, with the United Nations and the International Organization on Migration. So that's another aspect I appreciate from the work. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, um, I think uh, that question um, that about breathing and what, what the wild wildfires brings up is really important. My colleague, um, Lindsay Dillon and I wrote an article about um, asthma and uh, police killings. And we looked at the Eric Garner uh, killing in New York and um, on a parallel one um, based on her uh, 15 year engagement in Hunter's Point. And we talk, uh, we use a lot of, um, like, you know, fun on, you know, had that thing about, you know, colonialism, like in, impinges upon your ability to, to breathe. And that showed up a lot in um, the police, um, anti-police uh, killing organizing. You know, you see that I can't breathe, you know, um, everywhere, like with the NBA players and so on. And I've been um, thinking about this a lot. And, you know, the New York Times did um, an uh, overview and they, I think they found it was like over 130 police killings where the person who was being killed you know, said, I can't breathe. They have this incredible report that documents that. Um, also in the book, I talk about that phrase, I can't breathe, because it's also what happened to Jamal um, Khashoggi, uh, the, the um, journalist who was killed by agents um, of the Saudi government, which, you know, is an oil petro um, oligarchy um, in Istanbul. And um, I talk about this, there's a film called How to Love um, the World, that the climate can't change yeah. by Josh Fox, and you know he's the director who did Gasland. Um, mm -hmm. But he has he has this incredible um, uh, point where he talks about what does it mean? What can't can't you do when you can't breathe, or what can you do when you can breathe? And he talks about you know singing and um, dancing and love. And so I've been trying to think about what that um, that idea of um, what is it that people in the environmental justice movement want? And so at the very beginning, you know, on the, you know, I don't know if you're, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs or something, but like, you know, so the ability to have life continued, you know, is important, obviously. And then be not beyond that, but in addition to that, there is a sort of positive um, kind of freedom, you know, um, that isn't even, we can't even imagine what that looks like, you know, to be free from, um, 
oil and to be free of capitalism and to be free of white supremacy. And so the book also um, is trying to, or I'm trying to think about um, freedom, you know, in both the, not just the negative sense, but like the positive sense of like, what does it mean to imagine differently? And so that's why I think, you know, it's important to do all of the different levels of work. You know, the policy translation work that moves um, uh, movement values into um, the state of California, that's an incredibly important. Um, and there's also uh, work that goes on culturally in literature, you know, through um, like Octavia Butler's work and, you know, um, the, the ways to imagine that are more in the sort of cultural literary sphere. And, you know, uh, my thing is that I, I don't really think of these, these as separate domains, but they're all part of the same um, struggle. And so that everybody does like their thing and it, we need this work in every way, in all translation work possible. And I'm really inspired, you know, by um, like Elizabeth Yampier's work in Uprose. You know, it's community based, but they really, they were big leaders in the People's Climate March, and they're really involved in thinking about climate justice, um, both in the U.S. networked within the U.S., but also globally. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big task, but I think. For this big a task, we need as many people on deck to do it however it looks and not to prioritize one at the expense of another approach. Yeah, I also think that one of the things I tell my students a lot is, is like work where you work best, like, like find you your best self in the work and like, and like figure out like if you like numbers and data, do that work, but deploy it in the service of social justice and social change and environmental justice. Um, you know, others, others have a different thing. I, I wonder if you both think that in terms of transformational moments, you know, like it's a moment of danger, right? But it's also a moment of immense transformation right now. Um, and those two things, a, a kind of like conflict and collaboration in, in your book, Mike, they're very closely intertwined, this idea of of the incredible danger of this moment, but also the incredible promise. So we're like on the cusp of something that we're on the cusp of, of, and I'm not ever sure whether to, to think about, oh, we've got 10 years, you know, is that helpful to say 10 years or is it just like gonna disengage a lot of people? Like what happens after year 10? Do we just like throw up our hand? So I just think there's, there's this kind of like razor's edge that we're on right now where, according to science we haven't necessarily passed the point of no return but we definitely need to act now and quickly um and i and i do see the two not to make it into a um an opposition but sort of the policy work working kind of in tandem with broader changes in conceptualization like how do we even conceive of should we even have a term for nature or should it be something else like you know how do we conceive of of worlds beyond capitalism so yes it's a cliche to say it now but why is it easier to envision the end of the world rather than to envision the end of capitalism and and i'd like to open that to you as a question and also to ask you if you have any favorite examples of like what you think of as as a healthy post-capitalist type of space that could exist, what would be in that space for you? Um, if you? Even if you haven't thought about it, but think about like, what would, what would you populate it with? Um, Julie, do you wanna start? Sure, uh, the last chapter of my book talks about, uh, actually asked that question. Um, and that's why I talk a lot in that chapter about narratives and storytelling um, and, uh, I, I talk about Sorry to Bother You, that film, um, which I think is an important, um, I think culture and cultural um, production is important in terms of shaping the terrain of both critique, but also possibility. Um, I, am, um, uh, I am very impacted by the writing of Rebecca Solnit, um, yeah. which I think many of us you know, um, are, but she had, a, she had a piece that she called The Impossible Has Already Happened or What the Coronavirus Can Tell Us About Hope. Um, and I think that in that piece, she talks about these kind of big questions, which I think this is what um, the 
I always hate using like the crisis opportunity language because then you end up sounding like a, you know, like a university administrator, <laughs> you know, or like a, or a, or a government official. Do you know what I mean? Like the crisis lets us, you like, just let's be nimble. Yeah. You know? um, and so I don't mean it in that liberal, uh, neoliberal, like, um, sense of like, you know, let's use this as an opportunity to cut, you know, or to get rid of things. Um, but I think that, you know, for me, I have been struck by thinking of abolitionism um, and abolitionist uh, practice around policing and, and defunding the police. Um, to think about um, how those ideas are being leveraged in terms of um, the idea of building something different and building new. And so in Rebecca Solnit's piece, she talks about, you know, this idea of crisis, crossroads, and disasters, and those are her key words. Um, but she also ends the piece talking about freedom, you know, and what um, those moments of extreme danger are when the, these, these amazing things emerge. And, you know, that's the, the topic of one of her books where she looks at disasters and so on. You know, like these, these places where mutual aid and solidarity just sort of happens organically, you know, like after the 1906 earthquake or so on. Um, so I think, you know, there are examples, um, but I think we also have to make them. And that's where, you know, that's what, that's the moment we're in. Um, and I think the crisis has forced us to look at, you know, gigantic terms that usually we don't really think about, like, you know, or gigantic questions like, what's the point of an economy? You know, what's the point of a government? Um, and I think one of the things that the crisis did was explode the idea that there wasn't money. <laughs> you know, like the first stimulus and, and all the inequities in it. Do you know what I mean? It kind of blew apart, you know, the economic argument about like, well, we don't have money for a transition and so on. Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, I think that we can, we need to think about this moment. There are lots of on the ground climate justice um, communities that are talking about this as a, a lever point for um, having more people who in different political moments would just be kind of like, you know, everything's kind of fine. I'm kind of fine the way it is. Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, I, I'm always, um, I'm, I use Gramsci a lot in the book, you know, and so I, I use this quote about um, the old world is dying, the new, the new world is yet to be born, now is the time of monsters, you know? Um, and so it's, it's kind of horrible. It's like a horrible way to live in the moment of monsters. But on the other hand, you know, we don't really have a choice. Do you know what I mean? And other people have lived through those moments of monsters. Um, or annihilation or transformations in their way of life. And so for me, the, the, um, the only thing that uh, helps me is to connect with people who share the values of, of social justice and environmental justice um, and to think with those folks and to build community. So not to be too Pollyannish you know, about it, but I think that we really have to be you know, careful not to go into some sort of nihilistic spiral you know, about like, you know, oh, there, we only have two years left and our decarbonization window is, you know, closing. Um, and it's sort of like the, the mental abuse that we, we had yesterday from the um, debate. Do you know what I mean? Like if you're so demoralized, you know, and you're just like, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? That's also, that's a political stance too. Do you know what I mean? And so I think what organizers give us and what movements give us is clarity and insistence. Um, and that's, the, that's actually the main lesson, you know, from mm -hmm. the book. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and, and if you haven't read this book, you should, you should read it. The, the thing I also love about it is it's short. I mean, I love those short books because it's just like a really wonderful kind of, kind of, and not, not, not that I've write, I've written a long book, so don't, don't, don't take, you know, it's, it's, I always aspire to write a short one, but I think for that reason, it's just, it's accessible and it's right there and the argument is right there and it's very like easy to, to just, immerse yourself in it uh, in a short period of time, which I think can be transformational kind of in a personal way. Um, Mike, do you want to follow up with that question? I'm going to actually urge the audience. We have a couple of uh, questions in the q and I would urge folks in the audience, if there are more questions, to please put them in and we'll get started um, maybe after Mike um, kind of weighs in on, on this part of the conversation. I would agree with my uh with everything that Julie would say, I think we're at um, a historic moment. Um, these these compounding of disasters and issues with uh, racial justice is really creating ruptures in our society uh, where we can really sit back, uh, uh, we'll stand back that is, and reflect on what we want, 
um, our society to look like and really coming to terms and no longer being able to look the other way for of these sacrifice zones and or issues of uh, police brutality or sacrifice zones in terms of environmental degradation and understanding that if we don't have a sustainable society, we continually have uh, these sacrifice zones where we're dumping in all the environmental uh, hazards and environmental baths that eventually through a, a feedback loop and assistance uh, based approach is going to reach the, the rest of uh, society and no longer will it be sustainable. So, so I would uh, agree with Julie in terms of social movements. Social movements are uh, putting that political pressure. Um, you can have the best um, policy report, best data out there, uh, proving your disproportionate impact or the solution that you want, but without any uh, political exercise, politi exerting political power and building coalitions that will never come um, uh, into manifestation. So right now we're right in the momentum to push forward uh, for the type of society uh, that we want. Great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. I think that um, the first question we have is from Wilfredo Batista. Where do you see the EJ movement globally? Thinking about Puerto Rico and abroad in how the Black Lives Matter movement may be opening new avenue, avenues to EJ globally and locally. So does anybody want to tackle that one? Sorry, I was, uh, I, somebody asked me about a statistic of where I got the number from. So I was in the middle of cutting and pasting. I got distracted. Um, oh, I think, you know what? I would rather we, we act, I mean, I would like to No, it's fine. I actually would rather answer. I, I let myself get distracted by trying to be like, I knew someone was going to ask me the stat and here I have it. Um, I will put it in the chat. Um, okay. And we can so, also address it live if you want to. It's totally uh, uh, so I think the environmental justice movement is working um, in partnership and collaboration with people all around the world. I mean, I think this is one of the amazing things about um, the moment we're in is that the movements themselves are making, um, uh, are, are building solidarity across, across um, struggles. And so, you know, the book talks about how people in Flint went to Standing Rock, you know, for example. Um, and, you know, I think when I think about what is happening now and where it comes from, I was talking to my husband who is a political journalist and you know, I was telling him and I was like, life was so much better before the internet, you know? Cause I'm like old enough that I can remember, you know, when, it, when the internet started and stuff. And so, you know, the, <laughs> so the internet and, you know, conspiracy theories and, you know, all of the ways that, you know, the, there's uh, not to be, um, uh, too naive about it too, because you know, obviously, you know, the technology can enable organizing across right-wing groups, you know, and for right-wing groups to organize, and that's you see that very clearly as well. Um, and but on the other side, you know, groups who have um, who are fighting similar struggles or similar actors are networking um, globally, and they they did before the internet, but the internet allows there to be easier um, connection before um, that. And so, you know, I think that there are um, coalitions um, after uh, in Puerto Rico that are very involved with um, degrowth movements in Latin America. And so, you know, movements, justice movements are always very capacious in their geographic scale and in their temporal scale. Um, and so, you know, the um, Junta Gente is a coalition after Maria that focuses on climate transition and sort of what food justice looks like post Maria. Um, in on the island. Um, and so I think that there are a lot of examples that are out there. Um, the, the internet also enables more knowledge to be shared about um, the struggles that people are facing and also the histories behind them. And so part of what the goal of the book was, was that, you know, when something happens like, you know, Standing Rock, you know, there, now people can share these like syllabi where, where they'll just explain a lot of history or, you know, what happened after in Charleston you know, when, when Dylan Roof went in and killed nine black churchgoers, you know. And so there are all these incredible, there's incredible like resources that are being available, um, that made available, but that most people aren't gonna sit and like read them all, you know. And so I wanted to synthesize it, um, but I also just give people a taste of like all of the, um, the work that uh, justice movements are doing on the ground, um, which is pretty vast. So climate justice, 
Um, the Indigenous Environmental Network is involved with global in, um, Indigenous struggles. They're networked with folks um, down in, in Latin America and also, you know, Indigenous groups in, in Europe. Um, and so there's, there's just so many examples. And that's, you know, without, I always um, have to answer this question of like, you, the internet allows that and it, and it also allows something like much darker. You know, so, you know, what we need is the um, clarity um, uh, to cut, kind of cut through that. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about Chiapas or? Any yeah, other uh, so uh, that's specifically a question that uh, comes up in my book in um, chapter six that looks at these translocal movements that California environmental justice groups, as I mentioned, um, this, this analysis of, of a multi-scale or how these these uh, activist groups are moving between policy, geography scales and uh, time scales as well. And understanding that these uh, these carbon trading markets that have aspirations to become global markets have implications for places like Mexico and Brazil, and I talk about the, that chapter really aims to show the power of these translocal movements. How um, concept of environmental justice activists of envir environmental justice in California were able to work with indigenous rights uh, groups in Mexico and Brazil that were both uh, confronting issues of. Uh, uh, environmental impact, uh, dispossession of lands, and uh, and uh, issues of environmental justice, and how they came together um, in commonality and build trust, um, and understanding that well, uh, these were both just the justice issues, the California justice issue, and then a global South justice issue. They were quite different, and the context um, were different, and how they came to terms with that. Um, so we see this. We see this at the United Nations. We see this at other types of uh, global platforms where environmental justice groups, uh, indigenous um, tribes from the United States and other uh, groups uh, uh, confronting environmental um, injustice are collaborating both on the internet and, and in these global platforms and is helping create uh, new uh, concepts that are is traveling throughout the globe. Great. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, let's move to the next question, which is actually mirrors a question I was going to ask you anyway. Um, what mod this is from Thomas Kim, what models of praxis are out there to guide young people toward radical action consistent with the themes of the session? Put differently, what specific campaigns or organizations are out there that you would point to at this moment? Um, and I would say, adding to that, uh, you know, what advice would you give like a co college age students, you know, um, in terms of you know, what they can do to make a difference, you know, and, and, and they're dealing with a very grave world. All of our children are actually, um, regardless of age. Uh, I don't think that, that the youngest of children are really insulated from anything. So I'd be curious um, to know what, what, what the, what your, uh, how you would give students advice and, and what models of praxis you, you think are out there to guide, to guide people toward action, making a difference. I would say um, get to know the, 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 some of the key community organizations working on environment. If you're interested in environmental or social justice issues, looking at what, what are the organizations in their community and do the work. Um, reach out to them, um, build a relationship with them, volunteer your time, um, donate, donate either your time or, or your resources uh, to help enact some of those campaigns. I always encourage students that are interested in environmental justice uh, uh, work to have a form of reservoir. Positive. If they're, they're pursuing um, their education and doing a research paper um, and they're studying that these issues, that not only are they interviewing these people and writing about them, that's just not enough, but you also have to um, have a recipro uh, reciprocity and ensure that what you're doing also benefits them. And you're creating a product, uh, you're doing, again, doing other types of work that directly helps the movement. Uh, we see this. Um, with the sun, uh, Sunrise Movement that's uh, been bringing in a more of an intergenerational um, re resurgence into the environmental justice and the, the, the climate justice movement, an important uh, process. But there's also long established uh, organizations such as Uprose that um, Julie mentioned um, that are there that want to continue and have those relationships. So there's uh, a, a lot of organizations now that um, I would encourage people to find out that are out there, uh, specifically in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. Julie? Yeah, I think that, you know, Mike hit on a lot of really good examples. Um, there's, 
I, for me, I think the way you framed the question of like, what advice can I give? And I think actually we're in a really different moment where I learn as much from my students mm -hmm. um, and their ability to um, learn and connect things. I mean, it is an incredible um, uh, what is happening now. And it's also an incredible like um, psychological burden as well, yeah. because um, I think that, you know, I was, for example, I remember I worked when I was working in New York, um, I had, I never knew about climate change. You know, that wasn't a thing that we understood, you know, because the oil and gas companies had basically suppressed it for decades. Um, but I didn't know about climate change. And I remember reading this um, uh, Hurricane Katrina from the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Coalition. They had done a fact sheet about what a, hur a hurricane would do in um, New Orleans, you know, what a hurricane. Um, major disaster event. And it was 1997. Mm -hmm. Katrina was in 2005. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh my God, this is not real. This can't happen, you know? Um, and of course, the, I was treating it like a dystopian novel, mm -hmm. you know, when actually the reality that we're in is that we're all in a dystopian novel. Like where, you know, you've seen those memes of like Octavia Butler tried to warn us, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And so I think, you know, I don't understand what it's like to be a young person to not have, to, to grow up with this, you know, and how it shapes your sense of hope and futurity. You know, I don't understand that. And so it's hard for me to give um, advice because it's a very different psychological kind of landscape. You know, the only advice I could say is that there are people who have been fighting for a long time, you know, and at some point you make a choice to fight with them. Yeah. You know, it's the fights are going to happen whether you whether you opt out or not. Do you know what I mean? So you you throw down on on a side, you know, and you do and you do whatever that is, you know, um, whatever you can. That said, you know, there are politics of working with community-based organizations. There's sort of, you know, issues around expertise and, you know, that kind of um, thing which you know, can be questions that are tied to educational privilege. Sometimes they're tied to class. Sometimes they're tied to race. Um, and so I think, you know, to do work collaboratively with um, a community-based, you know, organization or a tribe, for example, like they have a lot of students who want to work with them. But, you know, at sometimes, you know, I, I remember when I was directing the Environmental Justice Project, with Beth, which Beth Rose Middleton now um, directs, you know, there was, we did this gathering and um, the, the head of this tribe was like, if you start this, you are with us forever. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, the, this, if you want to engage, it is a lifelong engagement. And I think that can be scary sometimes for people. Do you know what I mean? Um, but on the other hand, we're, we're in this all in for the lifetime anyway. So mm -hmm. I think it's better to have, you know, a sense of like clarity and the, the stakes. Um, and I, I'm really impacted. I really like this book by my colleague, um, Sarah Jaquette Ray. It's called um, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet. And she talks a lot um, about what climate change for the Gen Z generation looks like and sort of how to not fall into like a politics of um, despair, you know, but around sort of principled opposition to extreme economic concentration, extreme carbon, um, the harms from cl uh, climate change and so on. Um, so I think that's why I wanted to share um, the stats, you know, because I think there's that sense always of like, oh, this is a huge meta scale problem and we can't do anything about it. Well, of course we can, because it had a history. Do you know what I mean? And they're agents and they're unequally distributed. So if we keep our focus on what the fights are and who the targets are, you know, oil and gas companies, for example, you know, and by extension, you know, what does it mean to have a, a government that, you know, where the Environmental uh, Protection Agency is captured by oil and gas companies? Do you know what I mean? Like, if we keep our focus on what the stakes are, then you can, you know, keep yourself from going into that nihilistic spiral. So, you know, I would just, you know, use that to, as a chance to reframe the question, which is, I don't really have advice to give, because I have a different set of life experiences. Well, I feel my role as a professor right now is to support the struggles and aspirations of a generations of people who are facing things without any innocence that I was allowed to sort of have, you know, because by virtue of my age, I'm Gen Z, by the way, I'm not a boomer. My kids always say, you know, okay, boomer. And I'm like, I'm not a boomer, you know, 
I mean, not to oversimplify the generational argument, but I do think that there is something unique for um, young people now. And so also part of the book is um, talking to myself at different moments, like talking to myself when I was like, oh, this thing can't happen in Hurricane Katrina. Well, now we've, now it's happened many times, not just with Maria, but Harvey and Sandy and so on. So our, gener our life now is devoid of innocence, you know, of violence, whether that's environmental violence or um, police violence or um, uh, social violence. And, and we're about to see a lot more overt violence, you know, right now, political violence um, on a scale that is not exceptional, but it is rare in the US historically has been insulated, you know, for, for many of our lives. And so what we need to understand is all of the different struggles of peoples in the US, you know, so learning about the history of, you know, coined help row in the US is helpful to understanding the moment we're in, you know, understanding the policing of social movements and understanding what they look like in other places of the world. We, we cannot have a, an innocence, which, you know, as uh, people in the US, we've been, and we, I'm generalizing, have been allowed sometimes to have, you know, and that moment is gone. That moment is like the Band-Aid being stripped off. You know, so the question is, what do you do? You know, and that's the, that's the organizing question. Mm -hmm. question. Yeah, what do you do? Um, there's a, I guess there's a couple more questions here. One of, the, one of the ones I had wanted to ask you both was really, it was about the, the idea of the streets and like protest and, and like what it means to occupy the streets. And, and really ultimately it's about land and and, and control over land. So there's, there's definitely like, I think embedded questions in all this that, that lead in, in, in many different directions. And so, you know, as, as, as people interested in making change, you just need to pick one, you know, and, and just go, you know? Um, and I think that this question for me, at least the question of expertise is like really, really important. Don't go in there thinking you've got the answers, you know, recognize, that, that the people who are close to the problem are the closest ones to the solution and, and they're the experts, like, like Mike was saying earlier as well. Um, we have another question. Outside of academia, what key disciplines do you see as having the potential to accelerate a sustainable society? There's another question about um, cap and trade has been a successful economic approach to limit uh, global greenhouse gas emissions in California, but it is subject to manipulation and injustices and suggest another approach about a carbon fee. Um, and so I don't know if you want to, um, to, to kind of tackle both of those in tandem. I, I don't know, you know, academia is made up of disciplines and I, I, I'm pretty sure what the question might mean like what realms of, of work maybe as opposed to disciplines um, have the potential to accelerate a sustainable society? Um, one, of, one of the key arguments that I make in the book is that climate change and this conflict over climate change um, is uh, a cultural and a political question. It's not a scientific one. We have the science, we, we know the science is about the implementation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Julie mentioned a little bit about that innocence that we had before. Um, and then now you, it's in your face. But I, I, I would also argue that for many people, um, they ignore it. They have their own privilege and they're, they're benefiting from the, the current economic system uh, or the capitalistic system. Um, and so they're quite fine with it and they don't see that or don't relate to that. So it really does take um, political processes, uh, political power, organizing, social movements. So I say one, one realm, growing up in an environmental justice community, I, I was turned towards more uh, politics and public policy because I, w I wanted to be involved in a field, in a profession uh, that could have more macro and micro uh, structural changes. And I, I saw that I'd rather be at, at, the, uh, at the seat of power, next to that power, Mm -hmm. um, with policymakers and other types of experts, uh, and representing the and representing the communities that uh, have environmental justice to be able to do that, and uh, mm -hmm. so that, that's how why I picked that. I think everyone has, as Julie mentioned, everyone has a different path, uh, but I was more drawn to towards that political public policy realm, and the importance. And another uh, key theme in the book is the importance of an inside outside strategy among social movements. You need you need the agitators. You need 
you need the people protesting, you need the people um, creating um, all this noise, uh, need, needed noise, but you also need people in, uh, in these agencies, in the legislature, in Congress, um, uh, that are writing these bills or that know the maneuvers. Um, so we see that in California, this, this, this unique inside outside where you, you have activists now that were diehard activists that are in the governor's uh, uh, office now or, or at Cal EPA at a, as assistant secretary or on powerful um, uh, regulatory uh, agencies such as the Public Utilities Commission, the, the State Water Board and how this, or the Air uh, Resources Board, how this has changed the dynamic. If, if I started my career in the legislature in 2003 and to see that progression of, from an all white, mostly white male um, dominated environmental movement to having women of color, particularly Latina women, Latino men, African Americans, writing some of the key legislation. Almost all, two thirds of the key legislations re, uh, revolving around climate change was written by a, a person of color. That's changing a little bit, um, but the last 15 years, um, people of color have been leading that charge, so that unique inside outside. So that's when I saw that book about that marketed itself as the definitive history of California's contemporary environmental movement. I was so angered by it that people of color were just a footnote when people of color have been leading the charge, but constantly the mainstream environmental movement uh, does not, oftentimes don't want to acknowledge that, neither do they want to talk about the environmental racism or the conflicts that have happened in California's uh, climate change programs. That's why the subtitle of my book is Conflict and Collaboration. And quite frankly, um, I get a lot of pushback by the environmentalists, um, even uh, environmental scholars that are wedded to those market-based systems such as cap and trade and believe it in the holy gospel of uh, cap and trade as, as ultimate savior. They see talking about these fights and these infights within California, who's a global leader on this, kind of detracts from that message. It uh, puts California back, but we need to honor that history, uh, understanding why these conflicts and tensions exist and continue to exist. Otherwise, we're not gonna have any um, changes, any structural changes that we see. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I wanted to note that Zoe, Vavrek put a, a, a link to the Sunrise Movement for Claremont. Uh, Monica Mahoney has a question about activism taking place virtually um, and, and the sort of uh, minimization of, of how, does, how does the lack of available public space in marginalized communities contribute to the suppression of voices? Um, and I think, Julie, you were touching a little bit on this when you were talking about the power of the internet and the power of organizing in virtual spaces kind of leading to all kinds of, of outcomes as well. Um, does anybody want to talk about that just sort of as our last thing? And our very last question is what are some leverage points we see as being important to target in order to tackle the political and social systems and institutions that have spurred the environmental justice movement? So thinking in terms of, of leverage points. If we could maybe just, you know, keep those questions in mind if you have just a last um, thing that you'd like to say uh, to the audience or to kind of sum up, um, you know, your work today. I want to thank obviously members of the audience for, for contributing these, these questions, but I do want to give Mike and Julie, a, a, you know, the ability to kind of to, to wrap up a bit. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge, yeah, Mike, Mike's point about, you know, more people, some people are still comfortable you know, but I think the, the question is, um, are more people becoming less comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, and that to me, you know, not being a, a, uh, someone who is an empiricist, you know, it, it certainly seems that way. Maybe I'm, I don't know if that's actually true. I don't know. Um, but I think that, you know, we are in a really big moment, you know, and so we can't keep on doing the things that we've done um, because um, this is where the time running out, you know, thing does feel, you know, is real, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that we, sh we need to think about the urgency of the moment. And so, you know, the, this other book I wrote, um, which is much more an environmental studies and sustainability um, collection is really, I do think that there's more interest in thinking of these questions of social justice, interdisciplinarity, crossing sectors, than there has been in, in, the, in, the, in the 16 years I've been a faculty member. Do you know what I mean? And so more people are trying to understand what does that mean for my work? You know, so my colleagues who have been sort of able to think about 
you know, be do teaching environmental policy, but never teaching environmental justice. You know, they they are they have to now take it seriously. In the yeah. state of California, you have to take it seriously. You know, um, and I, you know, I would argue you have to take it even more seriously now in the U.S., even as it's being like erased and attacked at the federal level. Um, and so I think, you know, we all have a role to play, and we're all different people at different times. Like sometimes we're students, sometimes we're teachers. We're all members of the public. You know, we're all consumers, but we're also all citizens. You know, and so those are all, and I don't mean citizens in like the documentation sense of citizens. You know, we're we're members of a of a community. Um, and we have kinship with others. And that is a thing that is other beings, you know, non-human agential beings and animals and ecosystems. And that's actually a, a natural, I, th I think a universal thing that gets um, taken away, you know, kind of the more professionalized uh, we get. And I think that there is something, I have to believe that my hopefulness is that there is something that's very like core for many people across many traditions that believes in empathy and kinship you know, with others. And so that's, you know, sort of how I feel like the moment we're in is that there's this like, you know, a um, uh, 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 killing of what's actually, uh, uh, what's, what feels like most people have. But I don't know, maybe if that's not true. <laughs> we'll see. No, I, I agree. I actually cling to that as a core thing as well. And I do think it is almost the definition of being human. So I, I do think that, that that's an important one. Mike? Uh, uh, thank you for, again, thank you for this opportunity to present on my book and to have this very dynamic and engaging um, conversation with Julie and Susan and everyone out there. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I, we are uh, in this uh, climate emergency and uh, climate crisis. We see California, Texas, and Florida are at the forefront of the climate crisis. We have a compounding of disasters, um, including the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, hopefully um, these compounding disasters are trigger points, you know, in political science and public health. You know, they often talk about these trigger events that some catastrophe happens and then there's major uh, structural changes in policy and infrastructure that normally would not have occurred absence uh, a crisis. So perhaps we're at a, I was having a conversation with someone about that, perhaps we're at that. And it's also important to note that before um, uh, you would have people of the privileged classes to be able to get away from and protect themselves and safeguard themselves from floods, sea level rise, wildfires, and go away. But with the lockdowns of COVID-19, you can't run away with affluence anymore. Um, it's, these disasters are now following even the wealthy. So no longer you can go into the quote unquote your ivory tower or your castle or your summer home like in, in uh, outside of uh, England or even to Aspen or someplace like that. that these, these, these climate disasters are following. So hopefully um, that that's sort of a trigger that'll have um, uh, 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 a multiplier effect uh, for, uh, for changes in our society. So thank you again for the opportunity, but I am hopeful that the social movements, the younger generations are able to continue um, doing the fight and put a strong forward in intergenerational uh, approach um, and strategies to address the climate crisis or climate emergency. Thank you. Thank you so much to Julie C. and Michael Mendez. We're so pleased to have them. I wanted to also thank Stephanie Estrada from Communications, as well as John Morgan and Jessica Levy from our IT department for helping to set this up. Um, and thanks to the audience and for your wonderful questions. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Um, and for Michael and Julie, I put in a chat to you the, uh, the next place where we're going. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.